All right, we are happy now to be joined by NFL Network analyst, former beefy center, Super Bowl champion with the New York Giants. We got Sean O'Hara. Hey, thanks for making some time for uh, DraftKings today, dude. How you been? Yeah, doing well, Emerson. Good to see you, my man. Yeah, good to see you as well. Uh, we'll get into all the other teams around the league first. I know how excited you are to talk your uh, your former team with the Giants, though. Uh, you know, they're, they're heading towards their fifth straight losing season here. I know they've been plagued by injuries and, and inconsistent play. So, in your opinion, what's the number one thing that, that really needs to change to kind of right the ship there? Yeah, great question, Emerson. As I reach over my right shoulder and I, <laughs> and I grab the hat, that I got sitting right here. And you know what? You know why it's sitting on the shelf right now? Because I don't want to wear it right now. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like men right now. The number one thing I feel like for the Giants right now is I want to see somebody stand up and fight. Like I, I'm, I'm tired of seeing the same thing in and out. Well, you know what? We got to get better. We got to get, we're going to work on getting better, improve on things of practice. It, it, it hasn't happened. And, and I think Giants fans, and former Giants were disappointed. We're tired of hearing about all the excuses, and we want to see some production. I think when you look at the Giants right now, the one thing that has really plagued them, and it hasn't just been this season. It was last year as well. The inability to score points. When every other team in the NFL is finding ways to put up 40 burgers left and right, every team is scoring points, the Giants, for some reason, can't seem to do that. And with the rules – the way that they are now with, with everything kind of leaning towards the offensive play and the ability to score points. That's what everyone wants to see. That's what puts people in stands and lets people turn on the TV and, and tune into your game. Scoring points, fun to watch. Um, that, that's what the Giants need to do right now. They need to find a way to score some points. They've, they've shown that they can play good defense and they've shown that they can step up when they need to. And they've held teams to, you know, 14 points, 70 points, and they still lose games like that. That shouldn't happen. So uh, offense needs points, and, and they, they need them fast. I mean, some people look to the quarterback position, too, as the reason why, like, they're not scoring a lot of points there. Like Daniel Jones, we're, we're talking about one of the many players, you know, who are banged up on this team right now. Again, injuries just kind of crushing the Giants. But, like, three years after being selected, you know, six overall in the 2019 draft, people are like, can he be a franchise quarterback? Sean, what do you think his future looks like there in New York? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm sure Daniel Jones would love to know the answer to that, too. I, I think there's been a couple of things that have shown up with Daniel Jones that has created some concern. Obviously, the turnovers are, are something that everybody's talked about. But the other thing is, I don't feel like Daniel Jones, it's never been about his ability. Right now, it's about his availability. He continues to miss games. I mean, we just went from uh, Eli Manning, who didn't miss a single game in his 16-year career to, due to injury, and then now to Daniel Jones, who every year is, is missing games. So that's those are two things that I, I think are, are concerns, people have questions about. I go back to Daniel Jones' rookie year. He threw more touchdown passes as a rookie quarterback than Kyler Murray. And I think when you looked at that, you said, okay, man, there's, there's room for growth there. There's all kinds of room and, and optimism for the future. And things just haven't gotten better. So I don't put all of that on Daniel Jones. I, I, I put a lot of it on the, the offense, the system, and the supporting cast around him. Look, a quarterback, you know, like, like any car, it doesn't matter what's under the hood. It doesn't matter what kind of engine you have in your car. You could take the restrictor plates off the Red Dragon. If you have flat tires, if, if the tires are not working, that car's not going anywhere. And I think that's what we've seen with Daniel Jones. There's been a, the supporting cast around him has not been great. There really isn't anybody on the Giants offense right now that scares you. You know, Saquon Barkley used to scare people, but it, he, he's not himself yet. Um, maybe he will get back to, to the Saquon Barkley of old, but the offense is not explosive. So I don't look at it like, boy, Daniel Jones is the one holding this offense back because they've got all these explosive playmakers. It just has not been a good synergy. And I don't put all that on Daniel Jones. I don't think we can properly evaluate him given all of the dysfunction that's gone on around him. Um, and, you know, look, for, for him, now he could be, if he's coming, if, he, if he's back next year with the Giants, which I think he will be, there's a chance it could be his third offense in four years, five years. Yeah. Um, that doesn't help quarterbacks either. No, no, no. The coaching changes, head coach, you know, offensive coordinator. Of course, that that doesn't help. You're talking about the supporting cast. The good news is, like, as of right now, it's looking like the Giants are going to have a couple top ten picks. Like, it's going to be an opportunity 
to improve that supporting cast around Daniel Jones. What do you think the Giants should do come April? You can't win football games if you can't block people. And I think that's something that Giants fans have witnessed firsthand. Um, when I came to the Giants in 2004, the offensive line was was a weakness. And, and they were talking about, uh, you know, we're only going to go as far as the offensive line. And, and we, we knew we had to get better. We had to fix that quick. That's where I see the Giants needing to fix things, obviously, on the offensive side of the ball. But as, from a defensive line standpoint as well, you need guys on defense that can win on third and nine by themselves like you don't have to dial up blitzes and manufacture pressure you're getting it from people winning their one-on-one -on -one battles so i think those are the two areas of concern when you look at the giants look last year nick gates started at center shane lemieux started left guard and andrew thomas started a left tackle arguably three rookies look, nick gates wasn't officially a rookie but three rookies so that was supposed to be those are your young guys the right side was supposed to be veterans and then coming into this year there's growth with that. Well, Nick Gates breaks his leg. Shane Lemieux gets hurt the first week in training camp, and we never see anything from him. So they've lost some of their young guns, so to speak, up front. I think adding another piece to that puzzle would definitely go a long way in trying to fix this offensive line for the long run. I feel like this whole league is a puzzle we're trying to put together right now when it comes to the playoff picture. It's just, Sean, it's just the, the third time since, since 1978 that we have entered week 15 and not a single team here has clinched a postseason berth. Like over in the AFC, you got the Pats, you got the Titans, you got the Chiefs that all wrapped up week 14 with nine and four records. Who do you think is the class of that conference? I think the Kansas City Chiefs still are, and, and I, know, I know the Patriots are surging right now, and everybody's enamored with their ability to run the football and with their record. Um, you know, I don't think we know yet what Mac Jones can do with his arm. We know if they, if they run the ball 40 times, we know what they can do offensively. Their defense has played so well that they really haven't had to air it out. Um, in the one game that Mac Jones threw 50 passes in, he threw three picks. So my, my question mark with Mac Jones is still – um, you know, if, if he's asked to throw the ball 35 times in the second half and they all of a sudden don't, aren't playing with the lead, how does he handle that? I mean, look, I, I think the kid's been unbelievable as a rookie, so don't, don't get it misconstrued here. I, I, I think the world of Mac Jones, I think he's a stud and he's got, he's got a bright future. Um, we just haven't seen him have to handle that. We haven't seen him week in and week out have to drive his team on a two-minute offense and win the game when everybody in the building knows you're throwing the football. So, that is something that you definitely have to, to hone your skills at. In the NFL, it's a lot harder. So I would take Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs right now. They had their struggles early on in the season. They had their ups and downs. Defensively, they, they were giving up a lot of yards, a lot of points. Offensively, they were turning the football over. But things seem to have clicked for them. And now the offensive production, they just completely dismantled the Las Vegas Raiders and a team that just beat the Cowboys two weeks before that on Thanksgiving night. So – I think the Chiefs right now are the best team in the AFC. Um, we're going to see tonight uh, against the Chargers just how good they are. It's a great uh, barometer for, for both teams. But I think when you look at the talent on the Chiefs offense, how good their new offensive line has been playing together uh, has been a big part of that. And, you know, look, Patrick Mahomes, you just feel like with, with one flick of the wrist, he can completely change a game. Yeah, yeah, that defensive rebirth has been so huge for him, too. What about over in the NFC? Because there's a new number one seed this week with the Packers, and it's the Bucks and it's the Cardinals. All three of those guys are 10-3 are and three right now. So who is your pick to come out of that conference? You know, the NFC has been interesting because the Arizona Cardinals have had the best record for almost the entire season, and yet I don't think anybody has ever really bought into them. The, the last time that we had a big hyped game was they were playing the Green Bay Packers, I think, on Thursday night, and they were the undefeated team. Team, and Green Bay took them down, and they took them down without some of their receivers. There was no Devontae Adams. Um, and, and I think that left a little bitter taste in some people's mouths about who are the Arizona Cardinals. So I, I look at the NFC. To me, I think the two best teams are the Green Bay Packers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'll put the Bucs at number one because they're defending Super Bowl champions. They, they have gotten better offensively in some categories. I think they're much more physical right now as an offense than they were this point in time last year. I think a lot of that has been Leonard Fournette. Um, I think Chris Godwin being healthy at this point in, in the season has been a huge factor for them because teams are trying to take away Mike Evans, and now Chris Godwin and other guys are, be, are able to step up. Um, Tom Brady, look, uh, I mean, the accolades for him are, are limitless. And, and I think with the game on the line, I don't know that you want any other quarterback than him 
uh, given his supporting cast. So uh, I, I think the Bucks are, are the best team in the NFC right now. And their defense, even though they've given up some points at times, they can still get after the quarterback. And when they have a lead, um, nobody wants to play that defense. I think Green Bay is a very close second. Aaron Rodgers can do things that Tom Brady can't. And, and I think when you look at offensively, what he does with that offense, and, and look, they have great scheme, but some of the plays that he makes with Devontae Adams, it's like backyard football. Yeah. It, it's like vintage Brett Favre running around making things happen. The question I have with the, Packer, the Packers is what haunted them last year in the playoffs was the loss of their left tackle, David Bakhtiari. They couldn't block Jason Pierre-Paul and Shaq Barrett in the playoffs in the NFC Championship game. And here they are. They just lost another tackle. David Bakhtiari, they're not sure if he's coming back. So my questions offensively are, can they can they keep Aaron Rodgers upright enough so he can continue to make those big plays? What about a dark horse? Is there a team out there that you could see, you know, just making the playoffs and could actually go on a run and kind of shock us all? Yeah, you know, the, the AFC, I feel like, has a lot of dark horses. Oh, uh, yeah, a it's a mess. Ago, it's a circus, especially uh, in that, yeah, in that wild card race. It is a log jam right now. I mean, it looks like 95 north or south on a holiday weekend. Um, it, it is just bumper to bumper. And the Cincinnati Bengals are a very interesting team uh, to me. A, a few weeks ago, they beat the, the Baltimore Ravens. They swallowed up Lamar Jackson. And I remember thinking, wow, they are going to run away with the division. That's it. And then they stubbed their toe a little bit. They, they, the Chargers game, uh, they got knocked off with that, and they just lost another brutal game uh, last week. But I look at their offense. I look with, with Joe Burrow, what he has been able to do uh, with the with their wide receivers, T, uh, Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, and Jamar Chase, and, and with Joe Mixon. That offense, they can score points in a hurry. And their defense has really started to come along. Trey Hendrickson has been a great pickup for them. Uh, he's been phenomenal getting after the quarterback, and they've been opportunistic. So I, I've got my eye on them. They, they've got a big matchup this weekend against the Denver Broncos, and, and of course for them, that's like playoff. Uh, you know, it's going to be a playoff atmosphere for them because if they don't win that game, then they probably are, uh, have a, a, a long shot to get into the playoffs. But um, that would be my, my long shot for the AFC. Um, for the NFC, you know, look, I, I think Minnesota, it, 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 it can be a scary team. Um, you know, I don't think anybody really wants to play them, but I think the Rams are, are the one team that look out Arizona. The, the Rams are surging. And I think when you look at what they, the pieces that they've added, even during the season, adding Odell Beckham gives them unbelievable acceleration and explosive plays on offense. And then adding Von Miller defensively, I think has enabled Leonard Floyd and Aaron Donald to, to, to have a, a, a little bit more production. So I think the Rams are, are a team that, that nobody wants to play in the playoffs. Yeah, you got new parts that are finally gelling there in L.A., but, you know, back to the Bengals. They haven't won a playoff game in 30 years. So, yeah, they got to get right now up in uh, Denver's altitude. Listen, I know you played center in the NFL for, for more than a decade. Who's a guy playing today that you would just not want to line up against? I think the center for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Ryan Jensen, is a guy that I love watching on film. Um, he's one of those guys that is constantly playing through the echo of the whistle. Like he doesn't stop right when he hears the whistle. It's kind of like I'm gonna I'm gonna take an extra step. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a great movie called The Rock, and there's a line in that where uh, Nick Cage is is talking. They're in a jail cell, and he talks. He's saying, "I take pleasure in gutting you, boy." That's <laughs> the way Ryan Jensen plays football and he just takes pleasure. And you could tell that he's smiling every time he's pancaking somebody, knocking somebody on the ground. You know, like I, I like watching centers that on third down, when, when you don't have somebody rushing on you, that you're looking for work and that every single time he's looking for somebody to hit, somebody to chip, somebody to go peel off a pile. Um, I, I like the way he plays. What about going up against, lining up against? Like Aaron Donald seems to me like – you know, back in your day, could you imagine facing him, like looking up and that large human being just staring through your soul? Yeah, Aaron Donald is is one of those guys when you break the huddle, you know, I think a lot of offensive linemen walk to the line of, of scrimmage, like looking down, like saying, please don't line up on me. Please don't. <laughs> and like when he's lined up on the other on the other guard, you're like, whew, OK, I don't have to deal with that, that headache right now. Um, he's no doubt a, a one man wrecking crew. I think the other guy that 
that has really um, catapulted in the last couple of seasons has been Chris Jones with the Chiefs. Oh, yeah. Uh, they've moved him out. Uh, he's playing some defensive end as well, so he's going up against offensive tackles that aren't used to that kind of power and that kind of size. Um, and then his versatility and his quickness for how big he is, he's absolutely a handful. Um, he does a great job with his hands, and, and I know that'd be, a, uh, that'd be a guy that if you're going up against him for 65 snaps a game, you're going to be sore. Yeah, it, it's a good thing you didn't have to face any of those guys during that historic 2007 uh, Super Bowl run, the one where you guys took down the, the undefeated uh, Patriots. It, it still is bugging Tom Brady, as we're hearing a lot now with this new documentary that he has released, uh, Man in the Arena. When's Tom going to get over it, Sean? <laughs> Never. Yeah. I, I, I don't think you ever get over that. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of it's like getting dumped on prom night in front of your entire school. Oh. Like it, you, you, you may get other girlfriends, you may get married, you may, you may go on to have a happy life afterwards, but you're always going to remember that. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think Tom will ever forget that. And you know, the fact that they were so close to a perfect season, I think is probably what makes it sting even more, but um, you know, I, I'm happy for Tom. I, I've known Tom uh, through some mutual friends and mutual teammates uh, over the years. And I'll say this, there's not a classier guy. Uh, in the NFL right now, and, and there's not a classier guy to, to ever play quarterback um, for the New England Patriots, that's for sure. Um, and he, he's, he's been a, a great ambassador for the league. And you know what? He's won enough Super Bowls where I, I don't think he has to dwell on the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah, like he's saying he would trade two of his Super Bowl rings in order to win that championship in 2007 and, and finish the 19 0 season. Can you imagine having that many Super Bowl rings where you're like, yeah, I'll give two just to get one back? Yeah, yeah, he's, he could give away three or four and he'd still be in the win column, um, you know, and, and he's not done yet. You know, that's probably why he's willing to he's willing to cough a couple up because I, I think he's looking at it saying, I think I could steal a couple more before I tap out. Yeah, you know, he mentioned, too, in the documentary that had the outcome of that game been different, that it may have changed, like, his football future. Like, he didn't, he didn't know if had he won that game, maybe his desire to play as deep as he is now, if it would, like, even be there. Do you, do you think... You know, hypothetically speaking, if he wins that game, you think he's retired by now? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think, you know, as much as you, you play for the rings and you play for those championships, he, he loves to compete. And, and I think that, you know, look, he can go and, and, and do the match, you know, with Phil and with, with Peyton. Um, and he, you can have that kind of competition on the golf course and you can – try to fill that void in certain little hobbies and other little aspects, but there's nothing like going to battle with 53 guys and, and playing an entire season and winning it all together. So uh, I, I don't think that would have changed his mind at all. And, and look, it's not just Super 42. I mean, Super 46 didn't yep. work out for him. And then, you know, Nick Foles took him down as well. So I think as long as he's not playing an NFC East team in the Super Bowl, I think he'll be all right. How often do you think yourself like, Damn it! I'm 44. He's 44, and he's probably going to play till he's 50. Yeah, it's funny you say that. My dad asked. My son asked me the other day, Dad, how come you're not playing? You're the same age as Tom Brady. <laughs> and I said, Well, because I played a real position where we actually hit people. <laughs> uh, I don't think he appreciated the the, the comedy value in that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's remarkable what he's doing. Uh, obviously, playing quarterback is a totally different position. But that being said. You know, the the way that he's playing, I mean, he's not just handing the ball off 35 times no. and throwing it 15 times. I mean, this is a guy that's, you know, has shown no decline whatsoever. If anything, he gets better as the season goes along. I remember watching Brett Favre when he was with the Jets at the tail end of his career. And by week 14, I mean, he could barely throw the ball 20 yards. And so that that fatigue and his his maintenance for his body and the yep. way that he takes care of his body, the way he trains – it's very impressive. Um, he's clearly committed, and, and I think, you know, he, he's basically turned himself into a pitcher. Yep. And with the NFL rules now and with the offensive line he has and the offense and his knowledge of the game, he basically is standing on a pitcher's mound, and he's just wheeling and dealing. That's and, right. Uh, I tell you, there isn't a quarterback in the NFL right now that can paint the corners of the plate right now like, like TV. Yeah, Bruce Arians and Byron Leftwich definitely uh, making him work down there. Uh, Sean O'Hare, great talking to you. We really appreciate you making some time for us here at DraftKings, and uh, can't wait to talk to you again soon. All right, thanks, Emerson. Appreciate it. Hope you get out to uh, hone your seven iron a little bit. Hey, man, just tossing darts.